you're not going to get to the end of your life and be like, oh, if only I'd posted this blog post or, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're going to be like, why didn't I spend more time with my, my family and my friends? And why didn't why wasn't I a real life maxi? All right, everybody. So, yeah, we are here at, I guess we'll call it the annual meetup of the other life and other life adjacent community, let's call it. And uh, here in uh, rainy California, as it, as it is today. And I invited Luke Smith here as, as the special guest this weekend for a few different reasons. I know some of you here know of his YouTube channel, but I know some of you don't as well. So I thought I would give a personal introduction as to you know why I'm interested in Luke's work and why I brought him here. So Luke, uh, most people will know Luke, who, people who know Luke will know him uh, for his YouTube channel where he talks about digital sovereignty, Linux, free and open source software, and kind of associated topics having to do with generally, you know, building an independent life um, today. And as people know who follow my podcast and, and my own writing, you know, I'm very interested in this new wave of opportunities for people who are exiting institutions and embarking on new, weird creative and independent lifestyles because it looks to me like weird I, i'm a little offended by that i don't know <laughs> well uh, to a lot of people it, it looks weird no, that, and fair, i think honestly fair. even for those of us who are doing it as well as anyone could hope it's it's weird nonetheless it's nav navigating it navigating navigating it is weird um even for people who are succeeding in it it's like uh there are a lot of people right now trying to carve out yeah, weird, weird pathways to 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 achieve different forms of independence. And basically, Luke, I see you as as an ex, as one example of someone who's done this in his own way and and successfully. We obviously have in common a kind of academic history. For those of you who don't know, Luke was a PhD student in linguistics um, at Arizona, and he has a kind of interesting story where he eventually kind of defected from the academic institutions, kind of similar to, to how I did in his own way in a different context, but he's never really told that story. And we have overlapping audiences. Uh, so I've received over the years, I've received uh, many requests to have Luke on the podcast. So I've been meaning to do this for a while. Yeah, this has been like four years in the making. Like, I think it was four years ago you Something contacted like me first, um, which is probably better we waited this time because, you know, I think... I don't know. You can you can sit on things longer, and also more stuff has happened, and you know it's more real now. So yeah, um, totally, exactly. And so yeah, Luke had a promising uh, academic uh, trajectory as a grad student in linguistics, and he, through you know the things he's learned and observed, and this, the decisions he's made for himself, he decided that it would be better to just exit the institutions and, and carve out his own path. And he's done a quite a good job of that, doing it in a very unique way with a very unique style. For instance, you know, something Luke is kind of known for is that he's, he's very anti-internet, basically. He, he, you know, in his content, he frequently is, you know, making fun of YouTube and making fun of, and really criticizing quite harshly a lot of the norms and patterns that uh, we see kind of dominating people's lives today when they get addicted to different forms of content, as it's called on the internet. And so Luke has a very interesting style where he's basically built you know this kind of niche for himself this platform for himself where he's able to um you know express his ideas uh in the ways that he wants to over time uh, to a to a non-trivial audience he has, he has a, a very healthy following on on youtube but and he does it in this really honest way that is pretty unique that you don't find a lot of um out there on these channels where everyone is kind of like you know tends to do the same mimetic kind of saccharine you know like coaxing of their audience into you know dubious you know pathways basically dubious cognitive and emotional traps. Luke is always basically, he's built a, a kind of a, a brand around not doing that. And so I think it's just very unique and interesting and admirable. The anti-brand brand. Yes. Yeah. Basically. Very good brand. But you pulled it off and you're, and you're doing, and you're doing a good job with it. And, but a lot of the, the point that I'm driving at is that a lot of people don't actually know your whole story. Even your sure, audience, sure. people who, people who yeah. love your content don't actually know uh, the whole story. And yeah, so it's, it's a topic that I've avoided for a long time. Cause I felt like, I mean, this is, this is why we first came in contact. Cause you know, people would ask me, oh, you know, why, why did you leave academia? Like before, just at the beginning, you know, why do you do all this kind of stuff? And it's like kind of the, the well, the, the thing is like, I don't want this to be, I don't know, maybe I don't think you agree with this or I think you agree with this as well. I don't want this to be about me because I think a lot of you who have been in academia, you've experienced this too. And a lot of us have similar stories. And really, um, I, I, I guess we're going to talk about kind of biographical stuff about me, um, but also the whole point is like, how, how has that changed my way of looking at philosophy of science and, and lifestyle? 
lifestyle and stuff like that. That's right. Uh, Cause yeah. that's what matters, you know? Totally, totally, um, totally. Um, a lot of people in my audience are interested in these questions and how to figure this stuff out for themselves. And uh, so am I, I'm, I'm still figuring it out for myself as well. So yeah, I see you as an interesting case study and a lot of people don't know exactly, you know, how things transpired for you and the decisions you made at different points. So my goal for this uh, podcast is to basically tell that story and kind of, yeah, pull out from you, your, you know, heuristics and, and frameworks for just how you, how you've made these decisions and how you've kind of built this platform for yourself and this, this quite independent and resilient lifestyle that you have now. So yeah, that's kind of the context here. I just wanted to kind of lay that out for people who, yeah, maybe are curious about what we're going to be talking about today. So I think the best place to start is I want to learn more about just the basics of, of your, your academic story, your academic sure. narrative. Cause you, like I said, you've never really told this. I know that you, um, studied, you, you were a PhD student in linguistics at Arizona right. in the same department where Chomsky was for some time. Yeah. And I know all I really know from talking to you is that you things kind of over time gradually just felt inhospitable to you or not promising to you and you decided to you know uh, make a run for it but sure. but what happened exactly like how would you summarize your um, experience and 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 what what went down well you know the funny thing is i is i did a master's at the university of georgia um and it was a very it was a great experience I, th I think for a lot of people you get in the graduate school and especially if you're you know more intelligent person you've always been acclimated to to that way of life that lifestyle you get into grad school and you're like oh my goodness this is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me and that's how i felt when I did my master's degree, it was just like awesome. Like I really, you, you really feel like the alpha chat in the room. You know, you can do basically whatever you want. Or really, you're you're now getting paid to do the stuff you were doing anyway. Um, and I, I think it's a it, that's kind of how it felt. And that the the department I was at actually it wasn't even a department at the time. Um, the linguistics program was was very small and uh, not very bureaucratic. And I, I really enjoyed that. Um, but you know, we were talking a little bit before. Um, one symbolically, weirdly enough, you know, people talk about their academic influences. Um, one, one of the people who ended up influencing my academic life a lot was uh, Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> because like when it, once I finished my master's degree, that was that was in the before times. That was like back in 2014, 2000, at the beginning of 2015, right? And I remember like it, it was it was I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. What is it? Um, in the mouth of madness or something like that where it's not actually that good of a movie but like in it there's this point where he goes to this, you know it's this guy who's trying to um find this like weird novelist kind of styled after hp lovecraft and he goes to this he's going to this weird town and like driving there he just has these supernatural experiences on the way and stuff like that and it's just you can tell in the context of the movie he's going to like some kind of clown world and that like literally happened for me. So I was when when I finished UGA, I was going to drive all the way to to Tucson, start my life in Arizona. Didn't even have an apartment yet. And uh, halfway through, I stayed the night in Dallas Fort Worth, and that exactly was the night of the first Republican presidential debate. Right, that was the night of only Rosie O'Donnell and you know what's the other. Um, what, what do you say to Rand Paul? You're having a hard time tonight. Classic, classic Trump one-liners. Um, and so weirdly enough, like at the time, I didn't think of this as like a being a weird, uh, any relevant to me at all. Um, but I, I think Justin, uh, everyone who's been in academia at this period realizes this was like a weird, like everything just went haywire. Um, and so when I arrived in Arizona, I wasn't just arriving in a more bureaucratic department or something like that. I was arriving in like a kind of a weird inquisition. That, like that's the only way I can describe it. It, it was kind of like um, a lot of departments, like, you know, we, we are far past the day of like even pretending to, to dispassionately study things. Um, I, I think we've really degenerated. Uh, you know, this isn't even to say that I think that that's not an ideal that we can reach, but you know, things, it, it was like walk, it was like working in a, uh, working as a janitor in a cult. That, that's how I described it to people where it's like everyone there, like they know that you're not really a member of the cult and you know that they know that there's a reason you're there, but it's like kind of weird interacting with them and they can, they can always kind of sniff you out. Um, I was not like at the time I was, I never talked about politics. I wasn't, I didn't, I mean, frankly, I was, I was kind of like a, uh, maybe like a, a maybe libertarian leaning leftist kind of guy. Um, but like, I, I think for a lot of people, I mean, this is the, you know, I, I had, uh, read earlier in my life, some, some of the kind of, uh, Curtis Yarvin stuff, the, 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 who, who have these, 
these views of um, the, bureauc the bureaucracy and the university system, but it was only around then things started like clicking like, oh, like I understand like the, the kind of social nature and the, the, the systemic nature for the things that are going on in academia. And so that, um, weirdly enough, so yeah, Donald Trump was a, like a weirdly, not influential on me, but influential on the, the circumstances because you really, you realize the kind of crazy world you're living in. Yeah, people don't remember at that time, many of you I'm sure do remember, like generally in every institutional context, things just got crazy. Like people got crazy. Like I don't, isn't, don't they call it Trump derangement syndrome is, is, a, is a meme? That was real. Like they, during those years, everyone seemed to get weirdly crazy and uh, the the atmosphere or the mood in especially these kind of left-leaning bureaucratic contexts got really really uh, kind of yeah. wild so yeah, yeah. so like and, and you, how did it manifest like what did like what was your experience like um you know it's not the, the thing is it, it's firstly it starts as a feeling you you kind of get this conspiratorial you know feeling about things um and i uh, there i think i mean you know i don't want to name names or anything like that but there was a, a small group of graduate students who were agitating against me not because you know again i'm not a political or i wasn't a political person at the time and i don't consider myself a political person now. you were making youtube videos but they were no, like no 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 i wasn't oh, no okay. this started this started much later okay so i started um you know, I, 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 we were talking before this started. I think there's a sense in which also, like, the, the system is naturally, um, I, I guess, suspicious of people who have any kind of stern opinions, any kind of principled, oppos not even opposition, but I think who have a little too much testosterone in their system and might be liable to criticize you, even if they don't disagree with you. Yeah, even they, can if they, can tell, stand... they can just tell you're not going to fall in line. Right, right. So you're and, a problem. And, and that's kind of how it started for me. I think, um, I, uh, you know, it's weird. Um, uh, I don't know. The, the Arizona stuff is 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 interesting, but uh, and there are a lot of details with. Also, you know, this was a period where um, the witch hunts were happening for all all of these these people. Not just, of course, no one in my department supported Trump, right? Um, I mean, eventually I did, but it was more like because of my exposure to this, like you, you, you kind of see, see the psychosis of the system and yeah. you actually realize, you know, what, what Trump was about, you know, it's not, it's not about some specific policy thing or something like that. Um, but the re the thing about leftists, uh, the, the thing about like institutionalized leftists is that like, they might be saying crazy things, but they can definitely detect threats very well. And I think whatever you say about Trump's politics, there was the sense in which he is uh, extremely dangerous for the the kind of the the background radiation of like the smug institutional leftism mm. and like this this uh high, mightier than thou, thou kind of um uh mindset i guess and like he was just unabashedly against this absolutely lampooned the american political structure and so that that's why um, you know, one of the reasons that you know, things were just nuts, you know, mm -hmm. in academia at this point, and um, you know, anything can snowball into things getting more crazy. Um, you know, and at also at other times, I remember, you know, one other thing that was going through my my head at the time is it was getting to the point. I, I, most departments, right? I at least at the time, I think it's probably gotten worse now. But I would estimate like you probably have like 10% of a lot of these departments that are just like hardcore you know, stereotypical SJW types, right, that, that people always make fun of. And then the rest are like, they're, they're left leaning. Um, and they might even have like strong principles of like, you know, old school free speech kind of kind of guys. And that's that was the case at Arizona. But when push comes to shove that 10%, they everyone else is going to acquiesce to them. It's one of those, you know, uh, tyranny of the minority kind mm -hmm. of things. Uh, and that's definitely how it was at, at Arizona. There were a lot of people in charge, a lot of professors in charge who, who frankly, I, I think felt kind of like they had to acquiesce to a lot of the, a very small number of students that were forcing this kind of stuff on them. And it was really common, actually. I, you know, I remember um, the one event, I don't want to give too much away, but, you know, my advisor there, um, who's Tom Bever, um, he's famous in the field. I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but um, there, there's one point where someone had sent out some email on the listserv about transgenderism or something like that. And, and Tom, of course, he's, he's an old man. He's not, I mean, now he's a impeccable, he has impeccable political credentials, right? In, in terms of like, uh, I don't know, this, in terms of what you're supposed to be as a professor. In fact, back to the, back in the day, actually, I didn't learn this till after I, I left Arizona, but he actually appeared on Bill Buckley's, um, what is it, firing line? Is that <laughs> what it's called? Uh, it, he was debating against, uh, who is it, like, Richard Hernstein, the guy who wrote The Bell Curve yeah. with Charles Murray, right? So, of course, you know, he was taking the, you know, uh, IQ isn't, isn't, you know, biological or, or 
more you can look it up. It's on YouTube. Yeah, he has sure. this ridiculous mustache. <laughs> Either way, you know, there was this time where uh, he responded to something uh, about transgenderism on the the list serve or something, and he just got publicly chewed out by this graduate student. This like snot nosed graduate student just like berated him for like email after email just in front of everyone. It's one of those things, and and it just made me think like here here is this guy who's like extremely accomplished in his field, and like he's achieved so much in this system, and. You know, he even is like politically, you know, perfect in, <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. in all the senses you're supposed to be if, if you're a member of the intelligentsia, intelligentsia. And here he is getting chewed out by this like bratty girl um, who, I, it was just ridiculous. Yeah. Like, well, if I persist in the system is one of the things. Okay, so if, you're seeing things like this right. <laughs> happening, right. And in your case, like when, let's fast forward a little bit to sure. when, when you're starting to think about like, oh man, maybe I got to book it. Right. You well, know, I, I think we... I kind of think we should go back before okay, even sure. Arizona, right? Um, because I, I think uh, maybe we talked about this yesterday, but I think there's a sense in which every academic, like academics don't do anything. Like, I mean, I mean, most of them, like they don't really accomplish things. And there's this, there's this mindset in your brain. You always have to be like, okay, the money that I'm getting is somehow justified, right? And I, I think this is something I had struggled with for a long time. Before I went into grad school for linguistics, I was actually in, in economics, and th this was a big concern. And you, you have to puff up the field you're in to, um, you know, megalomaniacal, you know, proportions to justify you doing it sometimes and, and receiving state money and stuff like that. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think the first thing is, am I actually contributing to the world in a meaningful sense? Like, is this Rube Goldberg machine where we're funding people to do like very insular research or like even theory internal research? Is that something that's actually even meaningful in the first place? So I, I think um, this wasn't, you know, I didn't leave academia because of, oh, crazy liberals. Uh, I actually thank those people because it, it really, I mean, they're, they're kind of a symptom of a deeper problem. That's what I perceive. Like, I don't hold it against any of those people. Anyone who has seriously wronged me, I will happily forgive them, um, and I don't hold it against them. But um, I do think that it's it's more, this is just a, sim this is, it only happens because there are deeper problems. Okay, that's how, interesting. How you, you say you would thank them. So, like, what did they teach you? What did they force you to realize sooner than you might have? Uh, well, um, what did they teach me? I don't know. I, well, what I do you thank them for? It's, it's more like, you know, you can't be too mad when someone is using the system for their own enjoyment, right? It's, it's not really their problem. I mean, it, it can be a very morally wrong, to, wrong thing to do that. Um, but ultimately, I, I think the issue is not the people themselves. It's, you know, the, the structure of, of academia and what actually is going on. So, um, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, before this, of, of course, you know, I, I had... Um, uh, I, I think starting out in economics, right? So uh, uh, just to give a background on that, when I was a kid, I, I suppose we'll start at the beginning, you know, when I was in high school, right? Um, the first way I got into linguistics is I started uh, learning Latin and Greek and, and stuff like this. And this was just something I, I personally studied. I just kind of randomly found a Latin book one day, found it really interesting. Uh, I would skip class in high school and run to the, the library and like read like th this commentary on the Bible and stuff like that. It's just, just like whatever I wanted. Um, and then when I when I went into um, you know when I went to do my bachelor's degree right so I decided on economics mainly because um, I, I thought it was a field that was like kind of interesting in it, like it was it was it had it touched the real world at least in my mind um, but it, it was also kind of this this it, it, at least in my view at the period it was a way of making uh, politics kind of scientific right. Um, and I think a lot of academic disciplines, uh, economics is definitely a perfect example where um, the entire epistemology of it is based on what is most convenient for people to preach to others, right? Um, so economics is like one of these fields where, um, it, it, like, if you want to offend an economist, just call economics a pseudoscience. Like, that's something they very much have, like, physics envy about all this kind of stuff. Um, and it was one of the first times in my life when I had to grapple with, okay, so what does it mean to actually have like a theory? What does it mean for it to, um, you know, correspond to the world in some way? Like, how can, like, is 
aggregate supply actually a thing? You know, so let's talk like, about this. Let's sure. talk about scientific method because right. you know you're 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 well trained and you know these debates. And I believe that you're into you know fire fire robin and epistemological anarchism. Right. So talk about that. Like talk about what is your what like what is epistemological anarchism and why do you subscribe to that? Well, view? epistemological anarchism is just like the normal way of looking at science in in all times and places. That's my so kind of summarize view. it for people. So I mean, I I guess we we should summarize it by explaining the opposite of that okay. okay so normally how things work nowadays i'll i'll make kind of a meta argument an institutional argument so the united states government more or less decides how to give us money in academia based on the peer review system now this is a relatively recent invention within the the 20th century now people did peer review before but it was something like very public right you you publish something and then someone like judges it right mm -hmm. Um, now every, all of that part is done privately, you know, in journals, and then you you publish stuff, and then they can talk about it. But it's all approved by basically the field beforehand. So the reason this is important is because that is often the metric of how people get funding, right? So what that means, like the the institutional incentive that provides for academics, is pretty clear. It you want to rule out everyone else who's not a part of your party um, by virtue of them not being fit for science. Right. Um, so in the case of linguistics, right, there are actually a, a couple different linguistic frameworks you can say. Linguistics, weirdly enough, I have a lot of bad things to say about it. But one one good thing that you can say is, is that it's kind of polycentric at this point, And that's kind of an accident. Um, maybe a couple decades ago is all, all Chomsky and stuff. But now there's a bunch of different pockets. Right. Um, but in general, each of these frameworks will try to you know, get their buddies funding and exclude everyone else by default. Um, and what, what this creates is an environment where people aren't necessarily like disproving each other's theories. They're more like just trying to say, well, they're not real science. So like Chomsky will be like, well, if you do statistics, if you do too much statistics in language, that's, that's really like butterfly collecting. That's the word he likes, the, the expression he likes. Like it's, um, you, you got to think about core principles. You can't look too much at data. That, that's a little hefty, right? You right. don't actually want to do that. Basically, it creates all of these turf wars over like what is allowed, basically. Right, right. yeah, yeah. So epistemological anarchism would be kind of the opposite where, I mean, it's more one of those let, let a, a thousand schools bloom kind of thing. Um, and, it, and I think although you, look, you can look at the history of science and you can see a whole lot of um, schools of thought and things like this, but there was never really like, you know, Stoic philosophers didn't want to say, oh, all the other philosophers, they should just like not even be considered. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure individual people might say that, but now there's very much like this institutional side of it that, um, you know, Know, like and 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 this is one of the reasons actually I think that science in nearly every field has kind of kind of become calcified in the 20th century right so in linguistics um, you know Chomsky is the pioneer of this like Chomsky is an, an effective figure not because um, like his ideas are so great and people in uh, I mean uh, we were talking before right a lot of linguists they look at like Noam Chomsky's contributions and they're like kind of confused by his writing and like it's like opaque and like they're not even clear like what really is generative generative linguistics what really is universal grammar right those terms they sound like they mean something but when you really get deep at it it's, it's kind of ambiguous and you look at other fields like like economics and and uh, where you know Keynesianism this kind of neoclassical Keynesianism is now the norm or e even frankly Einsteinian physics right and you see in the 20th century as as this peer review system as this as this metric of funding different um, you know academic disciplines became you know more more common you kind of feel this slowdown or I don't even want to say slowdown but there's this kind of stagnation um, in that there's there's one way that we can look at thing in, things in each of these fields and that's basically it um, and you know one of the things about this is just now this is not me saying oh I love diversity for diversity's sake or anything like that um, but I think foundationally you have to understand that like human reason um, is not fit to understand the world in a very simple sense and I think that the use of different theoretical frameworks is that by their own nature they can clue you in by their their underlying structure to different just like fundamentally um, uh, you, you will find data problems you wouldn't find in other cases. Or uh, real, really, um, I, I think a better way of putting it is that actual scientific progress, if you want to use that term, it's, it's very, I don't know, iffy, uh, is uh, 
having better and better phenomenology. And what I mean by that is like not developing better theories or like better equations, but phenomenology would be like relating, oh, the fact that, you know, this happens in an economy causes prices to increase or decrease, like a kind of, or, you know, that's in the case of economics, but phenomenology, increasing your, or improving your phenomenology would basically be uh, finding out new things about the world, okay, mm -hmm. to, to put it in a very simple sense. Um, and in that sense, like, I think mainstream science in, in many different disciplines is actually very bad at doing that. Um, and if, where, when they do do it, they do it in very rarefied circumstances. Most scientific disciplines, I really think at this point, are solving, this is 100% the case in um, linguistics, in generative linguistics, they're mostly solving theory internal problems that don't even make sense when you try to explain them to your grandma at you know Thanksgiving. So let me ask you this. When, so you're, you're going through your PhD program and you're kind of in this Trump deranged context where you didn't do anything wrong. There's no accusations against you. You just kind of feel like ambiently the things are closing in on you and things feel inhospitable and, th and things feel like your, your, your potential is, is feeling to you foreclosed. Uh, to walk us through, like, how do you think about the decision to like, I gotta, I gotta pick up and go, I yeah. need to, I need to try, I need to, I need to pursue a different life path. But I want you to tie. I want you to tie it into this question of epistemology. I want you to tie this into yeah. the question of like, how do we know what we know? Like, if you feel that you should do something, or you feel that something else somewhere else would be better, a different path would be better. How do you evaluate that critically and independently? How do you decide? Oh, this other leap is the true leap that I should take for myself. How do you think about that as as a, as, a, as a kind of inferential question how do, you, how do you know that a different path is the true path well i don't know if it's a question of epistemology but i'll say you know the reason i said that i'm thankful to people who might have witch hunted me um not even to accuse them of anything but the reason i'm thankful for that is i think they really encourage like by encourage by depriving me of this one path or by making it more difficult it made it easier to do the thing that i in my heart of hearts i knew was the right thing to do right and that meant cutting my losses leaving academia and like pursuing a life where uh i can i can be more personally independent and you know things like this right Th that i think is you know, that, that's why when these bad things happen, you have to be very thankful. Um, and the reason they happen is not, it's not just like magic. It's because like when you're in a corrupt system, it does corrupt things. And so in, your, in the second half of your grad school career, you, you did start doing more YouTube videos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually I did. It was, well, really I started it as kind of a, an outlet. Like I was kind of bored. Um, I think I was doing, um, I was learning law tech at the time. And I decided to like put up some law tech tutorials to like help mm -hmm. my friends or whatever. Um, so I started doing that kind of nervously. Um, and I started like doing a, it, at that point it was nearly all technology stuff um, and simple stuff it wasn't till really I left academia that I started doing things that were more like lifestyle-y or, or th you know I could speak more freely did the did your work on YouTube affect your decision to leave academia like were you kind of feeling like oh there's this whole other world out there and people are paying attention to what I'm saying this I could just do this instead. Sure, I, I mean, I, I told you beforehand that there is some. There's a point where I realized, okay, I get way. I mean, it was a very small channel back then, but I was like, I get way more views on YouTube than students I will ever have in class. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so you, you kind of realize, however well paid an academic may be, your influence on the world is actually pretty minimal. Um, like maybe like you're, you're part of this like Lovecraftian beast that it like has an effect on the world. But as an individual, you don't really have that much unless you're just like the, the alpha of your particular field. Mm -hmm. Um, so it did, it made me more intransigent, I think. And that's why as time went on, like I, I pretty quickly was like, okay, yeah, this is not going to be for me. Um, maybe that made me more, um, you know, abrasive. But again, like I, I was never confrontational with people in graduate school. It's not like, I'm not like a hothead. Yeah. Um, I, I'm like very much the opposite of a hothead. If anything, it was like me sitting silently and them knowing that I thought they were idiots. So the is, YouTube channel did kind of make you feel like, okay, I have these other, there are these other right. opportunities to build yes. a life where, you know, I can express ideas, develop ideas, share ideas and have some yeah. level of influence. Yeah, that's definitely true. But I will, I will say that I think the end goal is you know, YouTube is not a real job either, you know? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's just a fact of life. Like, um, I think the real thing is, um, you know, getting back to, oh, all right, let me, 
change. I'm not changing subject. Sure. But, you know, one. I remember when I was a teenager, right? I um, was reading about like Chinese philosophy, and I, you know, there's a point where the philosopher Zhuangzi, you know, he, he's an interesting guy, but you know, he has this point in one of his writings where he says, like, you know, what what is the ideal life, right? Um, and you know, as at the, if you're a, a kid who's a megalomaniac or something, or, or you want to have like this kind of effect, massive effect on the world, delusions of grandeur, right? Which I probably was as a teenager, and even as I grew up, like you, you wanna, you, you, you wanna be the best, like you wanna. Um, kind of work within the system, work up the system, right? But, you know, Zhuang just says, well, you know, what is the ideal life, right? Um, and I, I heard this first when I was a teenager, and he says, well, the ideal life is this, right? So you live in a small village, okay? You live around family and friends, and you have everything you need, you have everything you want. Uh, and then sometimes if you go on a stroll, you can walk out, you know, at the edge of the village, and if you listen really hard, you can hear the chickens, from the village next to you. But never in your life do you actually feel like you ever need to go to that village. And you might forever be in the village you came up in, right? And I, I think the, I, that's really the ideal. And I'm not just saying like at an individual level, but I think that the world, I mean, there's a natural, like human psychology is built to survive in that world. It is not built to survive in the world of academia, okay? <laughs> this is a, a something that is a historical accident coming from medieval monasteries or, you know, classical schools and things like this, nor is, you know, having a YouTube channel, obviously, because <laughs> that is a, a weird, like, parasocial thing. Um, all of these things, you have to look at it as being, like, temporary. And, like, the only thing that I think humans are ever really going to enjoy is the, the, the environment they've been created in or evolved in, if you prefer, right? Um, that's what our psychology is for. Okay, so let's unpack this, because so now you... You live in rural Florida. You have a very independent lifestyle. Oh, yeah, well, uh, so you okay. say things like you have an independent lifestyle. Oh, you have a you know weird lifestyle. Well, I'm not saying that, but like <laughs> I, I want to be clear. What I'm advocating for people is a return to normalcy. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that, that's really what it is. Or you can right. call it exit. You know, whatever whatever meme words people like. We're, we're right. exiting the those institutions and we're returning to normalcy. Like that's really the goal. And the thing about this is when people are plugged into the system, they're so we got to win elections, we got to do this, that, and the other. I have to be a part of this. When if you just kind of unplug from it, you realize, oh, I actually have a massive amount of control over my life. I can be uh, I can be a big deal in my com community. I can have a lot of effect on the world and my family and all this kind of stuff. So I definitely don't want to like. You know, independence um, is like it's the norm in all times and places. And even a hundred years ago, it was perfectly normal. Everyone was a doomsday prepper back then, right? <laughs> Everyone kept as much food as they could to survive the winter and more. Like that's just normal. And so I want to be clear: I'm not endorsing like a meme lifestyle. I'm endorsing <laughs> like the human lifestyle. Totally, that's so, a great point. That, that, this so is sorry to nitpick that. Like, no, one it's very word good. You said. No, it's very good. And, <laughs> and to be clear, before when I said weird, I was more referring to myself. No, I totally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this is awesome. Let's unpack this because the reason this is so interesting is that you're right. You're just returning to normalcy, but very few people who have a go at a kind of more cosmopolitan, highly educated, you know, high status career path, very few of them actually make the transition back to normalcy successful. Well, because it's comforting. Like, well, it's, this is, it's, but this is, this is what you have some alpha on, and this is what you are kind of unique and impressive on. There are not many people who, you know, do a PhD program. They're, you know, rubbing elbows with Chomsky. Their advisor is saying that they're going to be the next, the next Chomsky. You know, there's not many people like that who kind of look at it. They're kind of like, this is a sinking ship and it's also corrupt and awful. And I'm going to go live a normal life in rural Florida. So let's unpack that. That's what I want to understand, like how you think about that, because a lot of people can't make that transition. Like a lot of people, once they're kind of, you know, they're trying to get a PhD, they're living in a big city, they have all these aspirations, well, you know, well, it's you, like, you, you have how to, do you uncut from that? You have to pray for bad things to happen in your life. Okay. <laughs> that, that's the real thing because that's what happened to me. The decision <laughs> became a lot easier when you feel the pressure like, oh, I don't know. I mean, well, okay. So I, I told the, you this before we started about the thing with my qualifying paper. So, you know, just to say it very briefly. So I was a PhD candidate, which means basically you, you got everything but your dissertation. I, I'd written two very, well, I, I don't want to say they were fantastic qualifying papers because I wrote them and it sounds arrogant, but they, they were 
innovative. I'll just say You're that. You're proud of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought they were very good. Um, but uh, anyway, so there's one, one time I get called into the 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 by the department head and my advisor. I'm like, ooh, what is this about? I'm sure they're going to give me a ribbon because of you know all the great things I've done. Um, and they basically said, well, you know, we went through your your qualifying paper with a fine tooth comb, and um, oh, you, you know, we don't feel you cited this example correctly. You know, I, I think uh, you you put it at uh, 42A or you put it at the end of the block of 42. It should have been on 42A. I don't think you got 42B from this original source. All this kind of stuff. This is like totally you know inconsequential stuff. Um, but because of this, they, they decided, well, you know what? We're going to have to revoke your PhD candidacy status, right? And at this point, this was like such a bizarre, you know, they're not like accusing me of like, mm -hmm. you know, fraud or, or anything like that. It's basically like you punctuation problems, the equivalent, right? And I fixed it actually that day, I, uh, but I was extremely upset. This was like after I decided to leave, right? Um, and so... Uh, what was I going to say? Um, but like the the event. Oh, and they also called me back. I didn't go to classes for like two weeks after that because I was like steaming. No, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't really get angry about things, but I'm like, why do I even bother? Yeah. Um, but eventually they called me back and said, well, actually, we looked at the uh, rules. We can't actually do that. So I guess you're still a PhD <laughs> candidate, uh, which is, you know, that, well, that's that's how this that's how they work. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what it is. But uh, I'm, I'm just very thankful that stuff like that happened. Right. Because that is the kind of thing when you feel the walls closing in in like again a corrupt system like it it just it clears things up for you um because there's so many people who who basically right now are living like a fairly cushy life maybe they're a software engineer or something yeah. they're like making good money but they or they're an academic and you know right. whatever making good money have have some status or whatever but they feel really unhappy they feel like you know they 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 know that there is probably a better uh, more wholesome life out there for them if they if they were to try it right. but they can't make that leap so what do you think is holding most people back from like taking chances to pursue a more independent sure. wholesome life well firstly most people are going to be taking a pay cut it might not actually be a real like in adjusted terms a real yeah. pay cut like it might just be like you're you're making less but you're also paying less um, but that's one one difficult thing to sell to your wife. Firstly, mm -hmm. um, I, I yeah. did all this while I was single, right, so right, like right. Uh, like uh, actually I was almost delusional because I was like, oh, you know, if I if I really try hard on YouTube, I can make like maybe a thousand dollars a month and I'll survive <laughs> on that and I'll buy a house eventually. Which you know, thankfully other things worked out. But uh, if you're a single guy, you could do that, right? Yeah, yeah. Like you can take those kind of risks. So like you know, having to make decisions for other people that's a difficult thing. So if you want to do this, do it. If you're single, do it now if you're a guy um also i think like um i don't honestly that might that might be a lot of that's it. like just variable, the, the financial sure. yeah. risk and also i think there's the the sunk cost fallacy right so i uh, i definitely had that idea i've been spending 10 years in this what am i going to do just like leave um i mean that's fallacious reasoning but like if you're you know if you're dying in a fiery furnace oh, oh i've been in here for like five minutes now well, i guess it's been a waste if i didn't yeah it's stupid get out of it um so i i think that's another thing and you know i have a friend now uh, he's probably watching this but i'm gonna say it anyway um you know i he he's at a he's doing a phd i'm not gonna say we're because you could identify him but um I, I which i was trying to convince him out of for a long time and he's there in his his cope this is a cope that i had as well uh is that oh Oh well, you know, they just be paying someone else instead of me, you know. So <laughs> I'm I'm actually taking money from the system. Like that's nice. you know how you rationalize it, right? Um, which no, you like actually this is this is really bad for I, you. I want to talk about mental independence, or maybe mental yes. hygiene is a better word, because you know yeah. for people who who are here who don't know, you know, Luke like basically only uses free and open source software. He doesn't use he doesn't use anything else. He refuses to, and he, but he also doesn't have Netflix. He doesn't have a TV and he just like, he was surprised when, yeah. <laughs> when I said I didn't so, have Netflix. So, so, like so, so Luke has very conscientiously kind of, yeah, exited kind of the entire kind of like amusement matrix that most of us, certainly myself are, are, are still very much trapped in. And I just find it, it fascinating people who, who can do this. And so you, what it's you, what, not difficult, like that's it's not that's... difficult, but, but yet it is for some people. And sure. so th this is sure. what's paradoxical about it, you know, but I like most of the people in this room, I think, you know, people who, who follow my stuff, like we all, 
aspire to, you know, basically spend less of our time wasting it on like bullshit social media, bullshit, you know, like computer stuff that's just like destroying our brains. And really like most of us have a deep intuition that if we just spent as much time as possible just reading books and writing, like that would be the best possible thing. And, you know, all of us do that to to our own degree to the best of our ability. But you kind of have like gone further on that point than than maybe anyone because you've really cut yourself from all, off from everything else. So, so walk maybe. us through that like, do you think everyone should do that? Is that like a yeah, no brainer? Yeah, like, is your view it's that like no-brainer. everyone is being mentally poisoned and they should like oh, yeah. really cold turkey <laughs> like cut themselves off from all, all of it? Or like, yeah, how do you cold think turkey about if it? you can. Um, yeah, I mean, don't you all agree? <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, like, well, I, I would say that uh, if if I look back at my life, what, what's my biggest meta regret? My biggest meta regret is not being more absurd and intransigent and true to my principles earlier. You mm. know what I mean? And I think most people, like if you're weaning yourself off Netflix, that's how you're gonna feel too. You're gonna be like, why didn't I do this earlier? I don't I don't actually need this. Um, I, I think that is usually how it is. It's just people are comfortable with what they're comfortable with. And um, you know, as you stand around, I mean, the thing is like also in my personal life, um, I'm not like, you know, I might state opinions on YouTube and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm very, I like to think, I don't know, you can, you can say if I'm actually like this. Um, I like to think I'm very accommodating of people who are very much Netflix junkies and, you know, they're, they're all in this kind of stuff. But I think just having the aura about you that like, oh, I find cell phones annoying. Like, I think that has an effect on people just like being around them. They can just, I don't know, is it, maybe it's your pheromones or your testosterone level. I don't know. They just detect, you know, they feel like it's, it's funny. Actually, every girl in my life recently has been preemptively apologizing to me for listening to Taylor Swift's new album. I didn't know she had a new album, but they feel like they need to come up to me and say, Luke, I know what you're going to say, but I've been listening to Taylor Swift. I'm sorry. Like, I don't know. Anyway, so. So you're saying that when you cut yourself off from the amusement matrix, then you you start to exude this kind of like subtle... Um, I, like I've power always been exuding people, something. I don't know if it's a me but, thing or what. And, but but well, I guess what you're trying to communicate is that it actually people feel it and yeah, and exactly. see it and understand exactly. it we, more than they might than, than you might expect. Right. So we had this conversation before we turned on the mic. Oh, we should have just had the mics going like all day. But um, you, you know, you asked me something about oh, who's influenced me? So here's here's my take on influencers. Uh, I don't believe they actually exist. I don't believe I'm an influencer. I think really what happens is that in your heart of hearts, like you kind of already know what's true and what's not. And what you don't need is someone to influence you to that opinion. What you need is for someone to say that and then you're like, hmm, yeah, you know what? I've always thought that. Right. And th- so when I look back at like people I've read, I've never really felt influenced by them, but I've been like more inspired to to allow myself to think the things that I already thought. And I think that's usually like when you are on your phone, when you're like eyes are crusty staring at your phone on your bed uh, before going to bed, um, I think you already know that you're doing something really weird. And uh, <laughs> like I am not to blame for highlighting that. You it's know? so true. It's so true. And as someone who's like not, uh, you know, um, I spend a lot of time reading and writing, but I'm I'm not at all above these like super norm, like common, yeah. uh, abnormal, but common <laughs> bug man uh, habits like uh, that you, that you describe. I, I I'm 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 guilty of all of them occasionally, and I, so I I understand that maybe my questions almost sound a little stupid because you're just like preaching normalcy, and I'm like, but how do you do it? <laughs> well, normalcy <laughs> is not very common. Like the you know this yeah. is, might be normal, but it's not common. But are I guess um, just, are there any other um, things that you've seen that people might not know? Like so you said for instance like. Like when you do this, you know, people see it and notice it and it has an effect that you might not expect. Are there other um, things you've noticed, maybe benefits or powers that you've gained from cutting yourself off from all this stuff that maybe would surprise people to learn about? Are, are there other forms of, you know, happy surprises that you get from this kind of thing that you wouldn't necessarily expect? Um, I th- would just say you learn to appreciate life more um, and like... I'm like, I'm, I'm already preemptively tearing up. I'm, <laughs> maybe I'll change what I was going to say. You have like um, a more sensitive, no, just like I nature. Mean, like, no, oh man, this is awkward. Um, like I, I would just say that, uh, well, I'll say something different. Cause you know, um, I, I would just say you, you learn <laughs> to cool. relate yeah, to people. Oh, it's cool, man. It's cool. No, whatever. Yeah. Say the thing no, you're going to like you, you, you learn to enjoy conversations with people you wouldn't enjoy otherwise. And you learn to, um, really get out of your comfort zone 
and um, you, you savor communication with people you have in real life. And so when you're, when you're reliant on Netflix or something like this, you really are losing something um, that, I, I don't know, you know, I, I just in my life, the, when I was a kid, right, the idea of like, talking to an old person or like talking to like basically well, actually when I was a kid the, the only thing I wanted to talk to is like girls who were my age or younger and that was about it um, and I think like overcoming that and being able to look at people as individual people and appreciate them and um, that is something that I think like you're gonna go through a phase of boredom Okay, when you when you cut yourself out of this stuff, but then you're gonna like you're gonna realize I was on a drug the whole time, and um, you start like just craving, like I don't know. When I was a kid, I always thought I was like extremely uh, introverted, right, and and kind of autistic, and I realized no, that was like the environment I was in. That wasn't actually me. Um, so that's what I would say. Like you know, I don't have anything tear jerking to. I don't know, maybe when you experience it, you'll understand it, um, which I'm sure all of us experience uh, some of that, but you'll just feel like a fool um, because you're really like piddling your wife, life away um, if, you, if you're just like too invested in this like consumer, like uh, entertainment culture. That, that's what I have to say. And what do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make in the, like normie bug men who, like myself who kind of like have big aspirations to like, you know, live in a big city and be like cosmopolitan or whatever? Like what are, what are the biggest kind of mental mistakes or pitfalls or traps that you think like normal kind of like or abnormal, <laughs> like unhealthy aspirational bug man types I mean, make? It, it, that lifestyle appeals to people because it's it feels good and like it's it's fun to um i don't i don't know like the the spontaneous enjoyment is so great that the long-term psychological effects they're just kind of they're long term in the long term mm. we're all dead right um and i i think it's more i don't know like i i this might be my psychological type but i very young as a kid, like I got really annoyed by kind of superficial entertainment. Um, I always hated like, I don't know, Disney stuff. And like, you know, I got uh, around the age of 10, I stopped watching TV entirely. And I've never picked TV up <laughs> again. Um, just because like, you kind of like I uh, what I would actually recommend to people is not e in your in your your attempt to quit all of the stuff called Turkey. Um, like, think about how often you're actually complaining about all these things. Like about, oh, oh the media is all propaganda, the media is all weird <laughs> pedophiles and stuff. Um, like, th really, right, like you could just not watch it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, the thing that annoyed me for so many years is like all the, you know, people I know who are conservatives who are always complaining incessantly about Amazon or Facebook and all this kind of stuff. And they're using and buying stuff from Amazon literally every day. Like, could you please just go could you stick to your principles and you'll enjoy your life a whole lot more and again as i said that my biggest regret is not being more like that earlier and not being more intense and like you don't you don't have to be like a butthole to people like you know i like i'll stand for print i'm not the kind of guy who goes to like best buy and says i'm not wearing a mask i don't care blah, blah, blah. It <laughs> yeah. makes a scene. i'm not like that yeah um but like i don't know does best buy still do that uh, either way i'm <laughs> yeah. never buying from best buy again i don't know but yeah um <laughs> I had a friend who was like bragging to me that he did that at Best Buy and I was like, dude, come on. I, yeah. uh, but like, I do think at an individual level, you have to stick to your, your, your principles. And the sooner you do that, the sooner you like, uh, you admit to yourself what you actually know to be true. Um, I don't know. This sounds like really like obvious self-help stuff. Yeah, now yeah, I feel, no, I I feel bad. No. Uh, <laughs> but you know, on, again, like sometimes people just need to hear someone else say the stuff they know that's already true. So yeah, no, totally. So one of the things that's interesting about you, though, is that you have this like really, you know, uh, return to normalcy, back to the land, independence, like, uh, you know, uh, clear yourself in the matrix kind of attitude and lifestyle that you that you're true to. But you also publish to the Internet and, and, sure, and, and yeah. yeah, which I, is not in yeah. any way a contradiction necessarily. No, but it, it is a contradiction. Well, it's, it, it's it's not necessarily. <laughs> what my point is that it's interesting just because a lot of the people who feel the way that you do and who have the principal, you know, character to actually follow through on it are also going to be highly likely to say, oh, posting videos to YouTube isn't worth it. So, like, how do you think that through? Like, why, given these feelings and attitudes you have and your consistency with living, living, th living them through, like, how do you see the judicious 
and wholesome use of the internet to do things like express ideas, develop uh, well, ideas. I, I am weaning myself off the internet as well. And you're I you're trying to stop publishing as well. <laughs> uh, well, it's not an issue of trying. Like, I, I mean, I think it's kind of obvious if you watch my videos, a lot of it, I mean, a lot of times I'm complaining about things I used to do, you know, five or 10 years ago. Right. Um, and I think everyone still has, I, I think my goal is to be kind of independent of that. Like I, I don't psychologically need my YouTube channel right now, but I do think occasionally it's nice just as long as it doesn't interfere with the rest of my life. Um, I think it's not like disturbing me too much. Now there was a brief period back in 2018 when I was doing a video every day and I thought about it way too much. But I think if you look at it as kind of just this thing, you like writing in a journal every once in a while, in that sense, it's not really affecting me that much. And I think that's the appropriate way to deal with like making videos, posting blog posts, stuff like that, where, you know, you get, it's, 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 um, you know, you, you have a thing with people you've met online and, and that's fair. Um, but it's just like the people you know in real life have to be number one and eventually you can you can you know let those groups intermix and and meet new people and stuff like that um but as i i just want to make sure that that internet life does not interfere with the things that matter like if i i might get a lot of important github pull requests um but like if I don't know, someone needs me at their house for some reason i'm gonna go there like no matter no matter how trivial trivial it is um so it's just an it's kind of an issue of priorities and i'm not totally against using the internet for like a, as kind of a soapbox but i do think also like the more i'm invested in it the more uh problematic it is so it's 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 a it's a vice it, i think it's doing good uh for people um but you see it as a vice it, it's hard to say i don't know it's I feel like you give a lot of good advice to young guys and stuff like that. I, I, I feel like it's, I, it's... I'm conflicted of it. Like, I'm worried how it affects me. I hope that it affects other people in a positive way. Um, uh, but I want to make absolutely... I, I'm conflicted about it. I understand. Yeah. Like, listen, I've met lots of people who know me online and have been positively affected by me. But I will just say, again, my goal is, is, is you know, returning to the, uh, Zhuangzi's village. <laughs> yeah. And um, So you still do see it as essentially like a kind of... Um, um, almost, it, almost an indulgence on your part. Like it, you let yourself do this because it's kind of fun or whatever. No, no, no. But, not even because it's fun. It's because this is the world we live in. Yeah. Right. Like I'm not against someone like using Facebook or something for a good end or something yeah. like that. Right. Um, like I I'll, ideally also, I'd like to live in a community where, uh, I don't have to use a car. Okay. But I own a car. Right. Yeah. And there's a, cause I live in a, a place where we use cars. Right. Sure. Like we, we have to, to survive. And I think there's a sense in which I, you know, I'm not going to knock. Uh, I, I think it's very clear to people when you are using social media and stuff as a vice versus you're using them for some utilitarian end. And I think in most cases, they, they just suck up so much of people's lives that it's, it's really vicious. And have you ever thought about growing the channel more aggressively and then you no. consider, but no. uh, did you, did you even like think like, and then reject it. But did you think like, maybe I could do this? Should I, did you ever like evaluate that? Or it was, I, I, it was never on the table. I think my channel is our right now. I have way more subscribers than I ever thought I'd get. I mean, um, I thought I was always going to be like, you know, five, 10,000 or something like that. Um, so I kind of already feel like I've overstayed my welcome. I, I, I think a part of my mind was like, when I hit a hundred thousand, I'm quitting or something. So now I'm Excuse me. Uh, all the kombucha is just going straight to my gut. <laughs> I don't. Know, I have a very healthy gut right now. Um, so, uh, like, I kind of feel like I'm. I, I've never been like I want to be really big on YouTube because I think when, when you experience the weird parasocial relationships, you're like, I don't real. I don't want to do that. This is why the so-called YouTube burnout is a thing. It sounds like the most bratty thing in the universe. <laughs> oh, I, I post a video on YouTube and it's just so hard to be me. Yeah. Like, um, and these people who are getting millions of dollars have millions of subscribers, yeah. but that happens for a reason, right? Because the, you are doing something again, you're, you're not living in the village. You're not living in Zhuangzi's village. You have this, um, you're, you're in this like social situation where the incentive scheme is all screwed up, right? So you're not getting like your actions are not being repaid with the, the, uh, I don't know. It, it's just unnatural. Right. And so that's why I think a lot of people don't enjoy it when they get big. And I feel the same way because, you know, so that's why I never, I mean, maybe it'd be nice to have a million subscribers, but like, that's never been like a, 
I don't really want it. Because you, know? you feel you feel like trying to grow your channel more ambitiously would be a kind of unwholesome sure. well, uh, as you said, of betrayal of your values of what you think real life well, should also, be. Also, as you said at the beginning, like I'm, uh, you know, more like I don't want to say I'm authentic because now it's coming out of my, my mouth yeah. and it's sounds so. But like there is a sense in which I've always just turned on the camera and done stuff. Like it's yeah. never been like an official thing. So. Um, that said, that's my mindset. So I'm never like, oh, I hope I have this many subscribers by this date. It's just not, it's not, um, I, I don't care. Well, know? I think what's cool about your your story and, and, and your YouTube channel as a case study for especially more academically inclined, you know, um, sophisticated thinkers, writers, creators, whatever you want to call them. Sophisticated. Is that, is that, well, what's cool about you, in my opinion, one of the reasons I wanted to have you out here is that you've built a, a, a pretty substantial audience with that attitude like that's what's interesting is because a lot of people when they a lot of people who build large audi audiences have a kind of more purposeful ambitious power hungry kind of mentality that, and and you've done it with this sincere detachment and kind yeah. of just like you turn on the camera you say what you think you try not to get too uh, too into it you try not to worry about it too much yeah. and yet you've able you've been able to like I, make I, a dent in the world I, you know? I think more people i think people uh, that that's an undersold market i think if more people did that they would also be popular uh that's all i can say and the other weird thing about my channel is like um, you know, I started out doing tutorials on like document formatting. Okay. Like who, who watches that? <laughs> like who, who cares? Um, and then like, there's such a weird mixed bag. I started putting up weird linguistics pre presentations I give, uh, or just have videos talking about whatever. So like, I've never had like a set brand yet. People just watch me. I think, I think kind of for that reason, because on one side, like I'm kind of genuine, but I think it really comes down to wh what we were talking about before. Like people just want to hear what they already know is <laughs> true. Well, not right. like kind of confirmation bias kind of way. But like it, when someone is like kind of honest about the things that, the, you know, they know are true, like, yeah, it has this like appealing. soothing slash inspiring effect to just hear things you basically already know, but you're hearing someone else <laughs> say them. It's no, it's like totally pathetic, but it's a very, very real, right? It's yeah. like, well, and, it, and frankly, sometimes like it's just helpful for people to kind of like rehearse things that they already think yeah. and feel well, but to hear someone else say it like people get addicted to basically hearing on rewind things they already think and feel right. it just has to be followed up with action that's the only yeah. thing that i'm really I, I think is really important because if you, you just if you like that because it's enjoying enjoying enjoyful and <laughs> enjoyable enjoyable yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's right um then it just becomes, you know, you're just consuming another product, right? And it's not actually something that is actionable in your life, right? So it has to be, I'm, I want to inspire people to action. I don't want to inspire them to like good feelings. That's actually right. kind of stupid. Right, right. I like that. So you would eventually become an Orthodox Christian. Let's talk about that a little bit because it seems to me like there's, there's a correlation here. I mean, I feel like I know so many people nowadays who are both you know, uh, embarking on some kind of exit from institutions who are also finding themselves, you know, going down the path of Christianity. Uh, do you think there's an underlying correlation and what is it? I think there are probably multiple correlations here. Um, I, at one level, I, th I think specifically, well, firstly, there's the, the raw sense of like tradition, right? And you could argue that, oh, you know, maybe Roman Catholicism has this. I think orthodoxy is the, you know, the historically the the most historical church right uh, it has the most continuity um and i think there is some sense in which okay here's a social institution which on its face value right like when it, we can all be reddit atheists at some point and analyze things like kind of logically and like from our own perspective um but i think one of one recurring theme and this is like a one of the most important themes in christianity and it's also one of the most important themes in um kind of epistemology is that whether you believe that the human mind is created or evolved, it is not fit to look at the world and simply understand it, right? So um, we, we um, and that's to say that like the logical categories that exist in our brains do not necessarily correspond to things out there, right? Um, so that means that, and this, like modern physics, right, is rife with this kind of stuff, even if you, you know, you're skeptical of the entirety of modern physics, right? There is some sense in which, okay, quantum mechanics, right? So this is something that our brain is like not really fit to understand. It's like so counter counterintuitive, right? Um, and this is something that like we're, we're very much used to now, or even something like gravity, like gravity, we're very, in our society, we're used to this concept. We're used to this concept that like m matter attracts matter. But when it was first, you know, 
put into words by Newton, that's like a bizarre and occult idea that is, you know, obviously against intuition. That's not what happens on Earth. It's just this weird story that kind of unifies the, the movement of the planets with the fact that things fall on Earth. It doesn't seem to be at all related, right? So human reason is not fit to understand the world. Um, and that's why uh, Fireband actually in, um, sorry, this kombucha. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have drunk it, I, but I can't stop drinking it. It's so good. It's my, it's my favorite flavor, pink lady apple. Um, okay. So like Fireband actually even makes the argument that like when you're, when you're critiquing scientific theories, you have to be able to, uh, you, you have to even take into account like myth and like uh, biblical creationism and like all these theories that mainstream science would like totally dismiss. And one of the reasons is like when you have like a countervailing framework, like sometimes uh, for reasons I said before, you know, nowadays in institutionalized science, you have this very, you have this kind of stasis where there's this, we, we're at some kind of Nash equilibrium where everyone is just kind of circulating around some consensus that is nearly certainly always wrong. Um, so sometimes what you need is just something to shake up the entire enterprise. You need some group of people who believe that the earth is 6,000 years old to come in and say, oh, well, this is what we believe. And that is actually going to encourage a lot of like research in novel ways. Okay. So that's what Fayyaraban argues. Um, and I think that that's very much true. And that's what we don't have uh, nowadays. And the thing also, how this is related to Christianity, of course, is um, you know, human reason, I mean, this is one of the first things, this is like in every other proverb, right? But like man's wisdom is, is ultimately insufficient, right? And so a lot of the things we look at in uh, religion or human society, fundamentally, like they don't make sense to us at an intuitive level. And the problem with the enlightenment and the problem with, you know, leftism, let, let's say that, um, is it as its foundational assumption it's the idea that human reason is the metric to which we compare everything, right? So if I look at an institution, let's say I look at marriage or I look at like gender relationships, right? Oh, so why are there different social expectations for men and women? I don't understand that. Therefore, it's irrational, right? So that, that's a terror, that's a atrocious fallacy. Like that's a, a terrible way of looking at things because the reality is we might live in a world where quite literally no one understands why a social institution works the way it is. Um, but it is a, it's a long-term kind of game theoretic solution for uh, the problems that humanity faces. So in the case of marriage, right? So, you know, why does marriage exist? Oh, marriage is irrational for whatever reason. But, you know, I guess if you're, you're a sociobiologist, you can say something like, well, you you know, marriage, it, for men, it solves the issue of, you know, it disambiguates paternity, paternity, and for women, it assures that their children are going to be raised, right? So there's some kind of efficiency to these solutions. Now, no one sat down and thought that up, okay? And this is the nature of human society, and this is why I think the Enlightenment is such a problem, because it says everything has to be subject to my my perception of the world or reason as they call it. Um, and that's one of the big problems, um, I would say. Yeah. So I guess what it has in common is that in academia, one kind of starts to begin to feel like, you know, everything that we're doing here with our brains, trying to be really smart and model the world. A lot of it is actually not even doing what it's saying it's trying to do. There's, right. you start to see, there's a lot yes. of, um, there, there's a lot of, uh, kind of falsehood slipped in there. There's a right. lot of disingenuous motives, disingenuous yeah. kind of operations underneath the hood of all of that. You see that and you're kind of like, um, okay, you know, maybe this academia thing is not what it, what it initially right. pretended to be. And then you start to look a little deeper and you're kind of like, oh, well actually all of the enlightenment and like the, 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 the rationally controlled modern world, uh, kind of has a lot of the same characteristics. Sure. And so that kind of points back to a kind of just like you, uh, you know, move to rural Florida and return to normalcy. You also on a kind of, uh, uh, a uh, deeper level, you kind of re return to the normalcy of, of, of Christendom. <laughs> sure. Sure. And there are a lot of other things that played into that. I think specifically, you know, why I reconsidered Christianity is, um, sorry, kombucha. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I reconsidered Christianity is just that, I had, um, I started reading like classical philosophy and actually philo not even classical, more like post-classical philosophy where, um, like hermetic stuff and like Gnostic stuff and, um, 
uh, just other like ways of looking at, I, I guess, philosophy of the period, which, the, the, okay, so here's the thing about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment tries to categorize religion and non-religion as two like non-overlapping magisteria, to use Gould's terminology, right? So um, there's reality and then there's this stuff called religion and that's like, oh, moral sentiments or something like that. And that, you know, that's never been the way that anyone has looked at it until the modern world. And I started looking into like, you know, I, I read weird esoteric stuff like the Hermetic Corpus, and looking at it, my brain categorized that as philosophy, right? And so here I hear, oh, they're talking about all this interesting stuff like the Logos, and, you know, as, and, and they're talking about like consciousness and, you know, how they relate to God and all this kind of stuff. And then, like, there, there's a point where it clicked, and I was like, wait, the Logos. Where, where have I heard that word before? Like it's it's all it's all it actually is a derivative of, of Christian theology, right? So the thing about like Christianity, the thing about any successful religion. Now I grew up in in evangelicalism, right? And the thing, the most unfortunate thing about like evangelicalism in America is that, and I don't mean this as a, an offense to any evangelicals, but um, it's kind of it it doesn't really work for smart people. And I really don't mean that as an offensive thing, but there's a sense in which it has an appeal, like it, appeal, it appeals to your lizard brain, the idea of God and his judgment and things like this. Um, but traditionally, like Orthodox Christianity, like for a religion to be a true and longstanding religion as well, um, it has to appeal to people of all cognitive stripes. So there's a, there's a sense in which you can interpret a religion, uh, orthodoxy, in very much the way that, you know, someone can, uh, you know, the, you can use simple terms like heaven and hell and punishment and all this kind of stuff. All of that is perfectly orthodox and, and Christian and that's biblical. But at the same time, there's kind of an intellectual strata where, okay, here's what's actually going on. Here's, here's the process of theosis. Here is, um, you know, the, the logos and what all this means, what it meant in classical uh, philosophy. So like modern evangelicalism kind of has lost that. Uh, it's just kind of utterly gone. And the only thing that's left, so if you're a high high IQ individual, that sounds like a total masturbatory term, but a lot of like intelligent people, um, evangelicalism in a lot of modern religion, it's just so dumbed down, they, they don't really even have a home. Um, and so like re-familiarizing myself with uh, orthodox theology was very refreshing because I was like, oh, so this, this weirdly enough, like because it is, it's critical of reason because, or well, there's logos, but human reason itself is, is is deficient, right? It appeals to my my view of epistemology, um, and it's also like I can accept it as a philosophical mind, you know, framework, and I see the historicity of it. All of this like clicks. All of this makes perfect sense. And uh, you know, I never would have thought. You know, I was probably an atheist for. 10, 11, 12, 13 years. I don't know how, how long, but I, you know, I went originally through the smug, uh, I'm better than everyone else phase. Eventually I was like, well, maybe religion is for like dumb people or something, but in a, again, not in a condescending sure. way, but like, um, and I think as time, i never would have thought, I never would have thought I, I would have become a Christian hmm. uh, again. I just can't, I can't even believe even like maybe five years ago, uh, I, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, but, uh, and I, I don't know. So, yeah, that's yeah. That's so kind of that. you're you're also a, a polyglot, I believe, and so and you don't have Netflix, so you read a lot of old books. Are there particular books or particular um, angles into all of this that uh, on the Christianity front particularly sure. clicked for you? Like you mentioned, you mentioned some examples, but yeah, I, were there, yeah, were there I read particular the moment, corpus, which is not Christian at all. But yeah, like, were there particular realizations or moments where you like saw something that maybe other people here, like people here, would not know about because it's very obscure. weirdly like no, like I think that you know I have read a bunch of stuff, but that's more like after all this happened. I think that a lot of it is like God working on you individually. I don't think it's. Um, I, I also like I'm not like I'm not a big reader. I know that's a weird thing mm. to say, like, but I'm not um I mean I, I have a bunch of books, I've read a bunch of books, but like I don't really look at myself as a reader and I, I think a lot of times maybe books work for some people, but they've never really had that much effect on me. Mm. Um so I, I think it's more I I guess I'm more of a life experience guy. Um that's all I could say. I do uh, I don't. I don't know if there's anything else you're looking for. Yeah, there, no, no. I was just. I was just. I was just curious because yeah. you you read multiple languages and yeah. you you have a taste for some so obscure I, I do books. Think, so I do. I just think, wanted like to know where where is the alpha in like obscure early Christianity I, stuff. I have. 
I would just say, like, read any of it, like, read anything theological, and you're going to realize that, oh, the world is very different from how I, ex how yeah. I expected. Like, yeah. I used to tell people, like, even when I just, you know, the first language I learned, um, aside, from, aside from English, of course, was Latin. And, you know, the things that you learn from just looking at a different time and place and culture are very unexpected. Even one that seems superficially similar, you never really know exactly what's going to happen with that. And I think that really, it definitely, it, it puts, it gives you more of a postmodern view of like our, um, like our kind of liberal universalism. It really calls out uh, all of that into question. And um, that's the only thing I can really say, but I think that could happen with anything. That I mean, that happened when I learned Latin, when I uh, was learning like Chinese and Chinese stuff, like Chinese uh, uh, writings and stuff. Um, all It could happen to anyone in any way. I think it's more just like unplug from the world that we live in just a little bit, from, just from the time and place we are, like get off the Netflix, go find almost anything and you're gonna be fine. Or even better, better than an intellectual, I mean, one of, one of the other big differences between the East and the West and, and Christianity, okay, the Orthodox Church, right? Um, so the Orthodox Church, of course, has a distinction between essences and energies, right? So that sounds like a weird, you know, theological point but one of the things that, that means is that like we can experience god within our his energies in our lifetime whereas in the west the idea and this is like in, this is like one of the defining features that would cause the enlightenment and everything else but in the west there's this idea that well we can't really experience god you know in our life in our lifetime on this earth so the greatest pursuit is actually intellectual pursuits, right? Hmm. So it's learning things, mm. right? So that's where scholasticism, you know, became such mm. a big thing in the West. That's ultimately where the enlightenment came from because there's this, again, it's already rejecting that Christian notion of, you know, human reason is deficient mm. in some way. It's it's incomplete, right? Where, where if you think that intellectual pursuits are the highest thing that you can do, um, you're kind of already doing something wrong. And I mm. think that that is one of the things, like re reason got knocked off of its throne in my life, uh, or at least human reason, right? Yeah. Uh, um, there's a different, wow. there's a, a very different thing. My own perception got knocked off from the throne and that changed my view of epistemology and of religion and of many other things. And even how I interact with people. I think it's important to, um, um, you know, always give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, now, I, I will be very intransigent when I'm talking about, like, groups and principles and stuff, but at an individual level, you have to, like, I mean, this is just a fact of life. People do things for reasons, okay? They're always, like, no matter how stupid the things they're doing, they're doing them for reasons. And I think if you're a sane person, you have to understand why that's happening. And, of course, it doesn't seem rational to you, but in order to reach someone, you have to understand how the, how they think, right? You have to be able to talk to them. Um, now, that's not something that I shout from the Internet because it's more like a, a, a thing. When I meet a person in real life, that's how you have to act to them. But, you know, that, that's my view of it. Earlier today, you said you're a real-life maxi. Did I? Yeah, well, that sounds like something I said. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that happens all the time. My friend, the other, I'm not gonna say that. Well, I just there. think that's interesting. I don't know if you want to expand on that or or say more about what that means because it it is interesting. Like what you're saying right now about uh, intellectualism and how in the Western Christian tradition already, you know, the intellectual focus is arguably um, a kind of pitfall in it in itself. And so you're so you're so much of a real life maxi that even books you try not to fixate yeah, on. I, I wouldn't say I try not to. I actually just have a really low attention span, okay, okay. thankfully. Thank, uh, we can thank God for that. Okay. It's hard for me to read books sometimes, even though I have, like, you know, I've, I've read but lots of books. But basically you're just all in on in-person relationships in your immediate yeah, surroundings, yes, as, and, like, that is right. the, that is pretty much the most important thing in the world to you. Right, right, yeah. I mean, it's basically, like, every day I want to have dinner with someone different. Like, that's kind of how I look at things. Um, and... Uh, I would not trade that for anything. Um, I, I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, and like, it's just an event, like, again, when you're, re when you're going to get to, I think I said this in a YouTube video at some, maybe sometime recently, but like, you're not going to get to the end of your life and be like, oh, if only I'd posted this blog post or, you know, yeah. you're, you're going to be like, why didn't I spend more time with my, my family and my friends? And why didn't, why wasn't I a real life maxi? Um, because, um, again, like you don't want to have delusions of grandeur, like, um, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm, I want to participate on the internet just because I want to affect everything, right? Because it is true that you get, I have a platform on the internet, like I can affect lots of things and stuff, and that's nice to be able to do. But 
like that is not the enjoyment that you're going to get from your life. And that's really not what a human should be do. Like if you're doing it, it has to be like a pastime. Um, like you can't let it get in the way of the things that actually matter. That's what I would say. So, um, because yeah. it is, it's, it's, it's unwholesome. It's sinful. It's bad. It's I wouldn't false. say sinful. It, that's, that's what exactly a, is the problem. Do you think like, how do you say it? I'm I mean, as, as I said before, like human psychology is built to a particular lifestyle. So it's just unhealthy. It, it's, it's, it's a it's trap, it's there a trap are, that you many, could fall in and it's unhealthy. Like you'll destroy yourself as much as anything. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's just a little bit like you, I mean, obviously again, like I'm not against like using the internet or something like that, but yeah. it just cannot be something that takes up your entire life. That that's basically, you know what I'm getting at. I respect so, that. So, maybe just one more question i, I think uh, dinner is coming up soon so um i think my final question is just i'm curious how you see the the near-term future of all of these things i think there's uh, a lot of people are starting to realize how badly their brains are being destroyed yep. um by the different kinds of technologies that w we're all now dependent on and the amusement matrix that we're all very much kind of stuck in or at least many people are stuck in so there's i I think uh, an extraordinary kind of awakening and realization of how bad it's become. And there's a lot of smart, you know, capable people who are pretty willing to do what it takes to, to get out of that. There's a lot of demand nowadays for just, you know, technological independence, mental independence, right. uh, you know, independent lifestyle. So it seems like, uh, and then there's also many interesting kind of technological trends, let's call them, or developments going on, whether it's cryptocurrency or, you know, many different things going on right now where it seems like, there's this gradient where there's more and more ability and opportunity for people to actually carve out truly independent lifestyles to exit these, these systems that a lot of people are finding increasingly onerous and corrupt. How do you, I'm just curious if you have a kind of high level mental model of where you see this all going. Like, do you think more and more people are going to be doing what you're doing and kind of dropping out of the institutional rat race and living in a rural place somewhere, living in a, in a small village that's like uh, optimal for, for human flourishing in your viewpoint? Do you think that's going to become way more popular and, and people who do that are going to um, kind of thrive and excel and all the people who are kind of stuck in, you know, the cathedral or whatever you want to call it are going to kind of become more and more kind of unhealthy and unhappy and miserable and pathological. Do, do you see that kind of exacerbating or do you see something else? Like how do you, how do you see this shaking out in the, in the near to medium well, term? Well, note number one is that it, firstly, it shouldn't matter because you, you are not acting for everyone else and you're not predicting for anyone else. You got to do, I, I'm not trying to say yeah. you need to be selfish, but like whatever's going to happen, like you have to do what's best. Um, and like, I think that's pretty unambiguous, like what, what an individual's sure. decision should be that said, how things are, are how are things going to play out? I don't know, but I will say that in my personal life with the people I know, um, things are very positive. That's all I can say. Um, like not, and not just because, you know, I'm a, you know, highly charismatic influencer that's influencing <laughs> people or something like that in my life. Uh, I think that there is such an overwhelming, um, like so many people uh, my age and younger, um, they are, they, they, you know, they very much want to be independent. They're all about growing their own food, not sending them, sending their kids to public schools, um, not, um, just in every single way being, uh, being apart from the system. Kids right. don't have cell phones. Right. Your kid, I hope no one's kids have cell phones here. Um, okay. <laughs> awkward, <laughs> awkward looks. I don't even, I don't know what, I don't want to hear about it. Um, but, um, so there are just so many things that, uh, like in my life, I, I just can't, I can't even describe, I, you know, I know I was kind of saying, uh, oh, I don't like it when people don't follow through their principles by not buying Amazon or something. But there is a sense in which in my life, I can say that like, I, I can't help but be very optimistic for my corner of this country and uh, just how great things are do, doing and how, how many people have, have just turned things around and, um, you know, I, and w I think it's important for people to just set an example for those around you because that has just has a massive effect. Um, and it, you don't have to be super, you know, I, I, we were talking before, like sometimes you just have to be around and people can detect what you're thinking and doing and they, they see how you react to things. I think that's most important. Um, just, uh, but so I look at things very positively. It might be that in cities, things are going to get worse and worse and the cathedral is going to eat itself up. And I don't know, maybe they'll all starve and there's going to be collapse. <laughs> I, I like, I'm not I, like, I, you don't even know and you don't care. It's like, whatever. It, it kind of, like, it's kind of like, I don't care. Um, like, I think it does make a difference what happens, like how painful the process is going to be. But, um, either way, it's not a big deal for me because my optimal decisions are the, the same going the same path. Mm. And, uh, you know, I wish everyone else the best. 
Um, and you know, many of those people, many of the people who are, you know, I, you know, we didn't go, um, too much into my early life, but I was the worst of them all, like in terms of being a bug man. And, um, oh, really? th yeah, in, in terms of like, if I can turn myself around, everyone can. And, you know, I, I don't know that that should be in. Yeah, no, your, your perspective on that final question is fascinating to me, a, a little surprising, but in, in a really cool way, because people who are still embedded in institutions, it's like, they're the the mood right now is so pessimistic and and uh good and and kind of sad yeah like, yeah, like yeah. pretty much pretty much anyone like ha who has any kind of power inside of any institution whatsoever even like low-level people but anyone who's kind of like who sees their future as kind of like uh invested in current institutions the mood whether the left and the right the mood is just like everything is going to shit everything is doomed everything seems like unfixable and horrible right and you know you only see the people in like your small village yeah, and, things you're, are great. and you're just like everything's perfect what yeah, are you talking things about? are fantastic yeah. and they're getting better like every single day and I, I will say for those people who are still in the system like um you might it might feel painful to leave but i will tell you you know i sorry if this isn't optimistic it's only going to be more painful if you keep doing it you know what i mean like and that's if if, it, if i had left graduate school earlier it would have been way easier for me and uh, i don't mean that in a bad way but um yeah like things are great like the the transition was um, different, you know, before, before we started th it, this interview, there's a question you forgot to ask me. So I'm going to answer it. <laughs> okay. So the question you, you Good. said you're going to, or I said, you should ask me this is like, a lot of people are like, Oh, you know, I'm very intellectual. Like I'm a smart guy. I'm well read. Uh, uh, what am I going to move to the country with all these country bumpkins? Like that's, that's weird. Who am I going to talk to? Right. 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 Um, so uh, that's me ma making it sound more weird sure. than, or like mean than well, how you said it. But like, that's something that people, uh, people email me about this and I will just say like the, the, from the perspective I have now, the, that is such a, that's a concern that seems so obnoxious and condescending and ignorant. Right. Um, because, uh, like, I mean, let's put it this way. Like, there's an intelligence. Okay, so I, you know, I have a friend who just randomly came to my head. So I'll, I'll talk about him. He, he does mechanic stuff. He j just amateur mechanic, and you know, the thing is, something can go wrong with my car, and he'll come over and he'll do one or two things, and he will be able to, you know, when you think in, in logical chains, like the amount of like uh, Boolean logic involved in like <laughs> determining like a the what's going wrong in a wrong in a machine is like extremely complex. And so he's the kind of guy where he can just judge based on two sounds exactly what's what's going wrong. And that's a level of intelligence that, frankly, most academics just don't have. And like they, they have like this ex extremely simplistic way of looking at like rarefied issues and often are very scared when they see people who are like, the, you know, I think we said uh, mm. beforehand that like people in academia, they almost want to study things that don't matter because it's safe. Like they don't have to ever get burned. And so like seeing someone with like skin in the game and being able to like make these intelligent decisions, like in, in um, it, it's very impressive. So mm -hmm. I think you'll have a respect for people you wouldn't have respect for normally. And um, I think you, I, I'm never like, wow, I sure wish I, I could talk about I, I don't know what's well, a philosopher who cares. No, I, yeah. I don't care. I don't, there's none of this stuff <laughs> yeah. that I really miss talking about. Um, or like, uh, it's, it's just not, it may be a desire that's big in your head. Um, but a lot of those desires are really like kind of sociological. Like we grew up yeah. in a different class than a lot of these people. Uh, not, not even like that much higher yeah, in the yeah. class, but like, if you go to graduate school, you, you really just get acculturated to a different right. culture and, um, your culture is like, honestly kind of embarrassed. Like you're going to be the one who's like defending yourself, like in front of these people, like they're, they know what they're doing. Um, and so like it, it, that's why also it's very awkward to me, like explaining to people that yeah, like I have a YouTube channel in real life. That's one of the most embarrassing things you could possibly <laughs> do. Um, so like usually like I, I literally there have been times in my life where I've literally just told people, oh, I'm unemployed. Like that is less shameful than having a YouTube channel. Um, that's funny. Or, or, or my common thing is I, I'm retired. I like to think of myself as retired. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, All right. Well, that's fascinating. I, th I think that that covers a lot of ground. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming out here to, to this yeah. little community. We thanks have for here. paying for me to come out here. Of course, you're, you're the special <laughs> you're the special guest. Uh, it's interesting to hear your story. Yeah, uh, yep. the, uh, these are questions I've been meaning to ask you for a while. So I'm glad we you know got this on the record. And uh, was there anything else I forgot to ask you that I should? Um, well, I don't know. We can we could do it. So, oh, yeah, you have. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, should young men find a wife before moving out to the village? Or is that something that? 
I would say repeat after, the, so the, repeat yeah, the question. So the question he asked is like, uh, if a young guy is going to move to the country, should he get a girl before or after? And I will say, um, I would probably say, I mean, if you have the perfect girl beforehand, you know, I'd contemplate that, but I would say it'd be easier to get her after for two obvious reasons. One, it's hard to make a sacrifice and move out for a girl who is an urbanite. Um, like it's, it's hard to argue, you know, get her to move out. Secondly, um, I would say that the quality of women is probably better in the country. I'm just going to say, um, for many different reasons, they might be different. They might be weird to you. Um, but I'm just going to say they're going to be like a lot more not all of them, but they're going to be in general more pure and and I don't know. Just... So you you meet a lot of chicks in rural Florida? Uh, not originally, but now like uh, yeah, there are lots. Of, I, I think I was telling um, you know these other guys before that like I I regularly like put on parties for and lots of people uh, come like who uh, originally when I moved down I didn't know anyone remotely close to my age. Now I know lots and lots of people, wow. and uh, there are lots more people. And also the other good thing is like um, if you're in this environment, this is what I mean by like having influence on people like. Me being here, there are a lot of people who would have moved away who didn't, and there are a lot of people who moved back because of those people, and like, so like, mm. you have like a big effect, and so you will attract other people just because you're highly attractive. Um, Not it, yeah, just because you're doing the thing, like yes. you become the focal point yes. that makes other people want to stick around. Yeah, yeah, just because you're like supporting the culture, not because of any special reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. don't have to be as charming as I am. Well, thanks for the question, Adam. And uh, thanks, Luke. This was fun. I appreciate it. All right. Great. Thanks All for right. having me.